It's Gabriel and the Pips, and they start singing this song, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill towards men and women on whom the favor of God dwells. And they shepherds get up and move to Bethlehem to find this baby and they found him in the manger just as Gabriel said. And watch what happens. They're so excited they leave, and the Bible says they leave praising and rejoicing and giving thanks to God for everything that their eyes had seen. However, verse 19 says, but Mary. That word but is meant to make you see two different portraits here. On the one hand are the excited shepherds, and on the other hand is a quiet Mary. The shepherds leave praising. Mary is sitting there with the baby, pondering. The shepherds run out rejoicing. Mary is reflective. The shepherds are excited. Mary is concerned. The shepherds leave with joy. Mary is filled with worry. And Marcia, the same Mary, who one chapter earlier, after meeting Elizabeth being pregnant, began to praise God and say, the favor of the Lord is on me and the Lord has done wonderful things. The same Mary who was shouting a chapter ago is now quiet in the manger. She's given birth, she sees the child, and there's no praise, there's no shouting, there's no excitement, there's just wonder. Mary is having a manger moment. Thank you. 
Praise the Lord, everybody. The Lord. Come on, I said praise the Lord, everybody. The Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say Merry Christmas. And so this morning, especially, we want to lift up some songs that we can only sing at this time of the year. It goes by so quickly that we're just going to take a moment to just celebrate the Christ child in these simple uh, hymns of the church. So we invite you uh, to sing with us uh, a few Christmas carols. Is that all right this morning? And so we invite you now with a song that says, Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Let's come and adore him, Christ. Come on, let's say it together. Oh, come, all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. Oh, come ye, oh, come ye to
Oh, praise the Lord, everybody. Now, I need your help this morning. There is a, a part of the story that I struggle with every year. It's the idea that the Savior of the world came and there was no room. No room in the inn. See, my parents were from the South, and whenever company came, they gave up their bed, the nicest bed in the house. And we know that you give up the nicest bed that your guest room has to offer. Amen. But it's troubling to think that there was no room in the inn. And so the Holy Spirit started singing a little song to me, and I'd like you to learn it. Uh, real quickly, it helps me deal with that whole concept that there was no room. Help me, Carl. I'll make room for you, Lord Jesus. I'll make room for you, Lord God. There was no room found, so I'll make room for you, Lord God. Can you help me say it? I'll make room for you, Lord Jesus. I'll make room for you, Lord God. There in Bethlehem town, there was no Jesus, you're 
you need to move over. Come on and just praise God while you move it over. Come on, let somebody want to make room this morning. Hallelujah. So there's this song that we need to sing in order to feel like it's Christmas. Come on, say it. Jesus.
anybody come to give him glory? Oh, come on, come on. Is there anybody that came to give him glory? Come on, come on for the new life. Come on for the hope. Come on and for the joy he brings. Come on, I dare you to open up your mouth all over the sanctuary and give him glory. Come on, come on, it's Christmas time. Glory to the newborn king. Come on, come on, I say glory to the newborn king. Yes, yes, yes. Hallelujah. Turn to your neighbor and say it's beginning to feel a lot like Christmas. Hallelujah. We give glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Today, on this fourth Sunday of Advent, family, we light the fourth candle which represents love. And to light these can this candle, we invite the midweek millennial moments. This is a village group. And lighting the candle will be the facilitators, Sister Artura Jackson and Kadima Robert, and they are accompanied by their villagers, Carrie Mead, Oliver Mead, Baby Helen Mead, Tiffany Thurman, and Joshua Walker. Come on, let us give God praise for the love that God sent to us through the Son, Jesus Christ. Family, as we continue in worship, we turn our attention now to our scripture, a familiar passage as recorded by the gospel according to St. John. John 3, beginning with verse 16. And the word of the Lord reads in our hearing, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is the word of God for the people of God, and the people said thanks be to God. Beloved, as we continue in worship, we now practice our privilege to approach the throne of grace. And as we do so, we keep in our hearts and minds those who are traversing the valley of the shadow of death. We lift up Katrina Harrison Johns and children, the passing of their husband and father, Andre Johns. We lift up Linda Jones and Kishana Highgate, the passing of their husband and father, Richard Cortez Jones. We lift Sheila Wright in the passing of her aunt, Mary Hatcher. We lift Karen Kroom, the passing of her aunt, Patricia Oates Jackson. Family, we lift Maxine Bryce, the passing of her sister, Loretha Woods. We lift Twinetta Pearson, the passing of her husband, Michael Pearson. We lift Tommy Walker Jr. and family, the passing of their father and grandfather, Tommy Walker Sr. And we lift Bertha Mitchell and LaRufus Reed, the passing of their sister and aunt, Barbara Mitchell. Those in person and online, your persons, your family and friends might not be listed, but we invite you now to lift them in voice and heart. Please speak their names now. Let us pray. God, who we know in this season and beyond to be Emmanuel, one who dwells with us, it is to you that we pray this morning, first thanking you for your presence, your presence that we feel, your presence that we see, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for the opportunity to come into this sanctuary to praise and worship you for all that you have done. God, as we come with 
hearts of thanksgiving, we come realizing that there are some who come with heavy hearts. God, some who this, for whom this week has been difficult. We come praying for some for whom this season does not bring as much joy as they would like. We come lifting them now, God, knowing that you are a God who can handle all of our pain. You can handle all of our grief. And so, God, we do as the word commands us. We come casting our cares. We come doing so thankful that you care for us. We lift these names, God, these persons that are traversing the valley of the shadow of death. We lift them, God, and we ask that you would be a tear wiper in this season. God, tomorrow when there will be persons missing from around the tree, tomorrow when there will be persons missing from the table, We ask that you will continue to be Emmanuel. Continue to be God with us. God, we thank you. And as we continue into this worship service, our prayer is simple this morning. Have your way. Have your way, God. We lift up your manservant now. God, the Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley, strengthen him now in the name of Jesus to speak and proclaim your good news. God, we thank you that you will have your way in this service, that when we leave this place, God, we will be better because we've been in your presence. Be with us now and forevermore. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and give thanks. And all that believe said, amen. Sisters and brothers, as we continue in worship, we ask now that you would lift your voices and your hearts in the hymn of rejoicing, joy to the world. celebrate the joy that Jesus brought to the world. We ask that you share a sign of Christ's peace with one another.
Amen. Good morning, Alfred Street. To our guests to greet us, to grace us with the presence of God, with your presence in worship, to our family and friends who are watching and connected and worship around the world wide web. Grace and peace be unto you from God who loves us as both mother and father, and Jesus Christ who always and alone is our resurrected, our risen, our reigning, and our returning Redeemer. On this fourth Sunday of Advent, allow me to add to the chorus of voices that have already wished you a Merry Christmas. And we thank God for the gift that God has given to us. If you know that God has blessed you even before you open a gift underneath the tree, would you help me thank the God of grace and mercy for another day that the Lord has met us. How grateful we are for this opportunity to gather and worship. We always begin our worship after our praise and thanksgiving with a time of reverence and remembrance as we celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the ultimate gift that God gave us. Minister Otis read it earlier that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should never perish but have everlasting life. If you believe in Jesus Christ and receive him as your Lord and Savior, we invite you to this moment both in the sanctuary and online. When you entered in today, you should have received the elements of the Lord's Supper. If you did not, would you simply wave a hand? There are deacons who will gladly serve you even now. And we invite those who are watching online to join us in the reverence of this moment as you take hold of the bread and cup that you will use to help symbolize the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I shared at 8 o'clock that Christmas is a time of remembrance for many of us that we can remember Christmases as a child and the joy of running to the tree, only to learn a very valuable lesson early in life, and that is that some people are not good gift givers. <laughs> there are people who grant and give you that which you know you don't want. My aunt was a knitter. She liked to knit and sew. And every Christmas, she would give me some article of clothing she had knit for me. And no seven-year-old boy wants to put on a scarf that his aunt knit for him and say thank you. But I had an uncle who was a great gift giver. He held nothing back. He would splurge on money. He would run to Toys R Us. He'd find the hottest thing out. And I learned very early that no matter where he was, if he was giving a gift, I was going to be there because he knew how to give gifts. There's no greater gift giver than God. A God who never gives you what you don't want, but always gives you what you stand in need of. A God whose love graces us with forgiveness and mercy and second chances every day. And that's the gift that we open today. The gift of this bread and this cup is symbolic of the amazing gift of love that that God graced us with in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. The bread that we eat represents the gift of his broken body. He was born in a manger. He was crucified on a cross. He was buried in a tomb. He rose again from the dead on the third day. He has ascended into heaven, sitting at the right hand of God, making intercessions for our sins. And one day to the glory of God, he is returning. This we believe as we break bread and share together. In this cup is the gift of the memorial of the blood of Jesus shed on the cross of Calvary for our cleansing, for our forgiveness, for our unbreakable tie with God for what can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Neither life nor death, neither angels nor principalities, neither things present nor things to come can break us because of the blood. The blood of our Lord, let's drink together. Won't you pray with me? In faith, we receive what you offer in grace, O oh God. The absolute forgiveness of our sins, the eternal security of our soul's salvation, 
the precious indwelling of the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide us into a life that is pleasing in your sight and the commandment we have to share the transformative love of Jesus with others. Thank you for forgiving us, O oh God. Now may we seek to forgive one another. And as you've loved us, may we strive to love one another. This we ask in the name of Jesus, who is our Christ. Amen. Families who gather together today on this fourth Sunday of Advent, this Christmas Eve, it's with a joy that we welcome all of you into this space and to our family online. If you're watching online and you're not from the local Washington, D.C. area, do us a favor, put in the chat where you're watching from that we may have an opportunity to give thanks to God for the witness we share around the World Wide Web. We welcome our guests here today. We know that during this holiday season, there are a lot of family and guests who gather in to join us and bless us in worship. If you're a guest of our church family, you don't mind us recognizing you as such, would you just wave your hand in the air that we may thank God for our guests? Alpha Street, would you help me bless God for all these hands? Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. We know that you could have been anywhere else at any other church, but the fact that God guided your footsteps here is something we don't take lightly, and we welcome you to worship in this space. We know that God is present not only through our guests, but also in the gift of life that we celebrate. There's some folk around here today that need to stand up because they're Christmas babies and their whole life, they've had two for one. They've had to, amen, deal with Christmas and birthday all wrapped up into one. If you are one of those Christmas holiday babies, you've just celebrated birthday or have one coming shortly, would you please stand that so we may recognize all of our birthdays today. Alpha Street, help me thank God for these holiday birthdays. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. We pray that your family know that your birthday and Jesus' birthday are not the same thing. Amen. And you deserve a gift on your birthday. We also recognize the presence of God in the life of love as we celebrate our couples who are blessed to have another anniversary. If you're here today as a married couple and you're celebrating another year of better than worse, won't you please stand and allow us to recognize any holiday anniversaries today? Amen. Congratulations. Please, the man standing. We shouted out. No, you can't sit down yet. You got to shout out how many years. How many years you've been married? Four? And how long have you been married? Six months. Six months, all right. <laughs> she said, every day count in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Family, it is the end of the year. Um, Bob, we've got to fix this sound. Would you come up here and listen so you hear it as I do? Because this, is, this, is, this needs to get better. Thank you. Listen, family, there are some announcements that I want to lift up as we come to the end of this year that you may be aware of. Number one, please be mindful that on this upcoming Tuesday, the offices are closed as our families continue to celebrate uh, Christmas with their families. We do want to invite you back tonight at 11 o'clock for our Christmas Eve Vesper service a joyful time of both candle lighting and reflection over the birth of Christ that begins at 11, ends before midnight. Have an opportunity to get back home and celebrate with your families the dawning of this Christmas day. On next Sunday, New Year's Eve, we have both our 8 o'clock and 11 o'clock worship services. And then don't forget that we have a special 7 p.m. worship service that we celebrate New Year. And we invite you to join with us both in this space and or online as together we welcome in the new year that the Lord has given unto us. Seminary Saturdays are coming back. Every Saturday in January from 9 to 12, we will gather in this space and online for a time of scholarship and discussion as we delve into the issue of Christianity and social justice, not only within our own nation's borders and boundaries, but even across the world. We're taking a special time to think about, look at, and examine the conflict in the Middle East sharing some of the historical and religious background of what is happening in Israel and Palestine. And we invite you to join in with us on Saturdays from 9 to 12 in January. And I pray you've already marked your calendar. You know that Seek 2024 is around the corner. For those that are part of the life of this church family, you know that every January 
or whenever God directs, we go into a time of corporate prayer and fasting. This year, that journey is 21 days. It will begin on January 22nd and go all the way through February the 11th. So if you're marking your calendars, that is a time we invite you to join us in a consecrated place of prayer and fasting. Last year, some 12,000 people registered for SEEK. This year, registration will open on the 2nd of January, and we pray that you'll be led to the Lord to join in with us as together we go into our time of prayer and fasting. And finally, I'm going to ask that you would be faithful and obedient as you pray about what God places on your heart to give. We don't raise an official offering anymore in worship. We just believe that with online opportunity and with obedient hearts, no one's got to beg you or take time in worship to lift up the offering. You already know that worship and giving go hand in hand. You already know how good God has been unto you. I want to remind you that if you're one of those that enjoy the tax benefit that the IRS gives you for giving, that your gift for 2023 has got to be in by next Sunday at midnight if you want to count it towards your 2023 giving statement. I'm going to ask God's blessings upon our gifts and our giving. Then we're going to be blessed in song by the uh, Psalms of praise, and then we hear the word of God in sermon. Won't you bow with me in prayer? Lord, whenever we come to this moment where we are reminded that we are called to give, there's so many excuses we can come up with, so many things that are demanded by our dollars, so many things we could be doing, and the enemy seeks to remind us that that we don't have to give. I pray now, O oh God, that you would move upon our hearts with a remembrance of how grateful and gracious you are unto us, that you have never used an excuse not to bless us, but you've always met us at our point of need and gone exceeding and abundantly above all we could ask. So now, O oh Lord, with gratitude, we open our hearts. With the obedience, we give unto you. As always, I pray that you would grant wisdom to the leadership of our church family, that we might be good stewards and transparently accountable for all that you entrust into our care as we seek to change the world with the love of Jesus. Bless the gifts and the giving is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
the Son of God in a
Bible, God says that the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. We think that all of us have had some wise women and some wise men experiences where you guided us through the darkness of life. We thank you, O Lord, for the great light that is Jesus our Christ. Pray now, Lord, that you would speak as your servants are listening. In the name of Jesus, who is our Christ, we do pray. Amen. It's a little hollow tea and ringing, if you can bring that down. Brothers and sisters, on this eve of the birth of our Savior, I would on this fourth Sunday of Advent that you listen again to the reading of the events of the birth of Jesus Christ as recorded in the Gospel of Luke. If you journey with me in your Bibles or online to Luke chapter 2, it is our custom to ask those who are physically able to stand with us as we reverence the reading of God's holy word. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. And allow me on the onset to make no apology for the length of the reading of God's word this morning. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. When they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Mm. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. And on the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. May God speak to us again from verse 19. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. On this Christmas Eve, for a few moments, let's talk about manger moments. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Manger moments. I shared with you last Sunday some of the signs that I know I'm getting older. Zena, one of them came very clearly last Monday when my oldest child celebrated his 20th birthday. 
And while we were out at dinner with him celebrating his birthday, Shelly, he knew what was coming because it comes every year at his birthday. He knows at some moment during that night, I'm going to share with him the story of how he was born. <laughs> he knows almost verbatim now that he came at a most inopportune time in my life. His mother's water broke in the middle of a Duke game that I was watching <laughs> and wanted to see the end of. He knows that we got to the hospital and his mother was in labor for 17 hours before Dr. DeSandro came and said, he's too big, we need to cut him out. He knows that I almost passed out when they handed me the scissors and let me cut his umbilical cord. He knows all the story of how the first time I went to the nursery to get him, the nurse wouldn't give him to me because she said he was too light-skinned and looked Latino and could not be my son. <laughs> he knows that story. And he knows that every time we tell it, we sit around and we laugh and are filled with joy as we tell the story of the birth of Deuce. Cooper's birth was not like that. There was no laughter. There wasn't even a lot of joy. There's a whole lot of fear. Cooper came three months early. He knows that the doctors tried everything they could to keep him in the womb that he might continue to develop. He knows that when he was born, he literally was two and a half pounds. And he fit inside the palm of my hand. He knows that for two months, he stayed in neonatal intensive care. And that we set up prayer vigil over him yeah. every single day yeah. and refused to leave even when the nurses said, go home. Cooper's story is attached to the story of a young lady named Elizabeth who was also in neonatal intensive care unit right next to Cooper and died. And the fear of praying, God, please don't take my son. His story was not one of laughter. It was one of fear. Because, beloved, the stories of birth can be littered with laughter or filled with fear. There are moments of hands lifted up in praise and knees bowed in prayer. That the story of birth can bring joy to some and to others, it brings something else. The account of the birth of Jesus is a paradoxical partnership between thank you, God, and please God. It's eight months into the pregnancy of Mary. And the Roman emperor has issued a census to ensure proper taxation. The census requires that everyone go back to the lineage of their paternal ancestry to be registered. So Joseph has to take an eight month Mary from Nazareth to Bethlehem. It's about 70 miles, and on donkey back, they do 20 miles a day, so if your math is mathing, that's a four-day journey while she's eight months pregnant. Now, I've never been pregnant, never will be pregnant, but I have it on good authority that no woman at eight months pregnant 
wants to ride a horse 20 miles a day for four days in a row. This is not comfortable. Y'all, can I ask you a question? Why is God so inconvenient? Why is God so inconsiderate of my plans and my schedule? Why does God not consult me before God puts things in motion that affect me? This is bad timing, God. Couldn't you have held this taxation a little bit longer or done it a little bit sooner? Have you ever dealt with an inconsiderate move of God? She's on her way to Bethlehem. They get there only to find out that all the rooms have been taken. And wait, and nobody is willing to give up their room for a woman who is visibly pregnant. How rude. How ugly. I'm never amazed at the depths of ugly that we can go to with one another. Isn't it amazing how easily people get nasty? How quickly they become rude and apathetic to your situation? They know you've got to merge, you've even got your turn signal on, and they move up and won't let you get in. <laughs> Nobody gives up their room for Mary. Now, Mary's better than I, because if it were me, I would have raised holy hell in that place. Do you know who I am? I'm not just some sister off the street. I am Mary. I'm the one Gabriel came to. I'm not just pregnant. I'm pregnant with the Savior of the world. And I don't want just a room. I want the presidential suite. I want room service. And somebody scheduled my Manny and Petty for Monday morning because I am carrying the Christ child. But Mary seemingly says nothing. Maybe she's wondering, is this child really going to be who Gabriel said he's going to be? Maybe she's wrestling with how and why this is happening to her. Maybe she's worried about the fact that this is going down and we don't even have a room to give birth in. How can this child be the king, the savior, the Messiah? And it starts off like this. God, is this really how you want it to go down? Fast forward a little bit, and here come the shepherds. The shepherds come, watch this, when Luke says that the time came for her to give birth. Now, let me pause right here, Dr. Judy, and tell you, this is how I know a man is writing the story. Because no woman who's ever given birth leaves out the details of labor and the pain and the number of hours and the number of sacrifices that their body went through to birth you into the world. Labor stories are mother's way of ensuring you spend more money on Mother's Day than you do on Father's Day. A man's telling this story, that when the time came for her to give birth, they wrap him in cloth to make sure his limbs stay straight, and they lie him in a manger. Now, to make certain that you are always biblically correct, a manger is not a barn. A manger is the feeding trough of an animal. The implication is that they are in a barn, but history says it was more likely a cave where someone had hewn out in stone where the animals could eat or drink, so they removed the feed and water for the animals and laid baby Jesus in a trough that animals eat in. And it is in this moment that some shepherds come. Some shepherds who'd been out in the field watching over their flock, and all of a sudden, Gabriel came. The same Gabriel 
who told Zachariah to be quiet, the same Gabriel who told Elizabeth you're going to be pregnant, the same Gabriel who told Joseph don't be afraid to marry her, the same Gabriel who told Mary you're going to be pregnant, the same Gabriel now shows up to some shepherds and tells them, look, y'all, the Savior's been born, and you're going to find him lying in a manger. And before Gabriel is done, the Gabrielites show up, the angelic host. It's Gabriel and the Pips, and they start <laughs> singing this song, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men and women on whom the favor of God dwells. And they shepherds get up and move to Bethlehem to find this baby, and they found him in the manger just as Gabriel said. And watch what happens. They're so excited. They leave, and the Bible says they leave praising and rejoicing and giving thanks to God for everything that their eyes had seen. However, verse 19 says, but Mary. That word but is meant to make you see two different portraits here. On the one hand are the excited shepherds, and on the other hand is a quiet Mary. The shepherds leave praising. Mary is sitting there with the baby pondering. The shepherds run out rejoicing. Mary is reflective. The shepherds are excited. Mary is concerned. The shepherds leave with joy. Mary is filled with worry. And Marcia, the same Mary who one chapter earlier, after meeting Elizabeth being pregnant, began to praise God and say, the favor of the Lord is on me and the Lord has done wonderful things. The same Mary who was shouting a chapter ago is now quiet in the manger. She's given birth, she sees the child, and there's no praise, there's no shouting, there's no excitement. There's just wonder. Mary is having a manger moment. A manger moment when you are trying to figure out what is happening. A manger moment when she's sitting there trying to figure out how did I wind up here giving birth in a cave, lying my child where animals eat. Manger moments, manger moments are when you look up one day and you find yourself in a situation you never thought you would go through. A manger moment is when you are struggling trying to figure out what God is doing, how God is doing it, and why God let it happen to you. Major moments are when you've been praying for something only to find out that the path God has you on is not headed in the direction you ask God to lead you. A major moment is when you can't discern how something happened and even war, you're trying to figure out what your next move is going to be. What am I going to do now that God has allowed this to happen to me. Major moments are when people come around you and, and it causes some struggle because they celebrate what they see, but you know behind the visible there's some stuff they are unaware of. There's some struggle, some pain, some anxiety you don't know about. You look and you see this, but you don't know that when I go home at night, I'm wrestling. Major moments are when you've been taking good care of yourself and the doctor has the nerve to say, we found something. Major moments are when you made a vow till death do you part. And now you find yourself hooked up with Khadija, Sinclair, Maxine, and Regine living single. Major moments are when you've been praying that something will get better, 
and it only got worse. Major moments are when you've been faithful to God and your faithfulness has landed you somewhere you never thought faithfulness would take you. Major moments are when you're sitting trying to figure out what did I do to deserve this? Major moments are when you realize that God's path doesn't match your plan. Can I get you yet? Here, you know what a major moment is? When you look at God and all you want to say is, really? <laughs> really, God? I go to church every Sunday for this? I circle around the block for 30 minutes for this? Really? Have you ever had a major moment? It's not that you doubt God, you're just wondering why God is doing it this way. Because God, if you would have asked me, I would have written the story differently. Can I push it? Mary's having a major moment sitting in this barn with her child in a feeding trough because, Sister Ernestine, nothing has prepared her for this. When Gabriel told her she was going to be pregnant, he never mentioned a manger. Look, there were a lot of prophecies in the Old Testament that prepared her for what she was about to go through. There were prophecies that it was going to be in Bethlehem. So I knew that was going to happen. The Word of God said it would be a virgin. Okay, I'm good with that. The Word of God predicted that a star would rise. The Word of God shared that, that people would come bringing gifts and the shepherds would bow down. The, the, the Word of God prepared me for all of that, but what the Word of God did not prepare me for was the manger. What I'm about to say is going to escape some people, and forgive me for those who are offended by you catching it, but you know you're having a manger moment when even reading your Bible does not alleviate the struggle you're going through because you can't find anything in the Word of God that aligns itself with what you are walking through. Ah, oh, this ain't going to be for everybody because some of you have PhDs in Bible, but I want to talk to some folk that have opened up the Bible, closed it, and still didn't know what you were supposed to do. Folk who read Genesis and gave up before you even got to Exodus. Folk who opened up God's Word and still didn't know what God was doing in your life. Because sometimes I struggle even with the Bible in my hand. That the Word didn't help me with what I was going through. Here she is having this manger moment, struggling to understand her situation. And the Bible says, verse number 19, that she treasured these things. Now, I want to make sure that I break this word down because you may misunderstand it in an English lexicon what it means to say she treasured these things. The word treasured in the original Greek of which the New Testament is written is this word syntereo, S-Y-N-T-E-R-E-O. I don't say that just to flex on you. I want you to understand that it means something totally different than your New King James will read. You know what syntereo means? You want to know what treasure means? It means to preserve. It, it means, Judy, to keep from falling apart. It, it means to hold together. So while she's in this manger moment, she's trying her best to hold it together. Um, that all she's trying to do is keep from falling apart. Let me pause right here and preach to someone. God understands Centerdale. God knows I'm not always going to be shouting. God knows my hands aren't always lifted up. 
God knows I'm not always saying, thank you, Jesus. God knows I don't love everything that goes down in my life. God knows I can't just throw religious cliches at every struggle I'm going through. God knows that sometimes the best I can do is hold it together. I don't know who I came to preach to today, but I want you to know that faith doesn't always mean you just shouting and thank you, Jesus, and hallelujah, God. No, faith means I'm holding it together when I feel like I'm going to fall apart. I came to preach to someone today. Sometimes getting out of bed is the best you can do. Sometimes not slapping somebody is the best I can do. Sometimes just showing up is the best I can do. And God understands moments when you're not getting an A in your faith. Um, when I was at Duke, I was real serious about graduating summa cum laude. I, I, I wanted to graduate at the top of my class. For those who don't know, in undergrad, I had a biomedical and electrical engineering major. Getting summa cum laude with a BME EE is not easy. Doing well up to my junior year, lowest grade I ever had was an A minus, and, and I fought with the teacher on that. <laughs> I was a student that messed up curves, because 100 is an A no matter what curve you're on. Doing well, and in my junior year, I had to take the class everyone told me was going to be the hardest in the field, EE-170, Electromagnetic Field Theory. Mm. Beloved, have you ever had a class <laughs> that you don't know what you learned in that class? <laughs> you, you, have you ever sat down in an exam I didn't even know where to start. <laughs> I mean, it's got so hard in exams, we, we would just start writing formulas down, hoping that we get some <laughs> partial credit that this uh, e, e, a, a squared plus B squared, e, C, something to get some kind of credit. That's how hard this class was. It was a horrible class, and it messed up my GPA. E170 kept me from graduating summa cum laude from Duke University, and I was mad about it. And I remember sitting down with my counselor, my academic advisor, Connie Simmons. I said, Connie, I can't believe this class is going to keep me from graduating summa cum laude. Yes, she looked at my grade, and this is what she said. She said, why didn't you take it pass fail? Oh, wow. I said, pass fail. She said, yes, you get two classes yeah. in your curriculum to take pass fail. I said, well, what's the difference? She said, pass fail, you ain't got to get an A. Yeah. You just got to get through it. Yeah. You, 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 you don't have to be at the top. You just got to get out the end. And I came by telling you that every now and then, there's some tests in life that God says you ain't got to be valedictorian. You don't have to get an A. All you got to do is get through this thing. I don't have to like it. I don't have to shout about it. I don't have to love it. I just got to get through it. I just got to hold it together till I get through this thing. Um, she's got to hold it together. And what I ask that I bring to you is how does Mary hold it together? In this manger moment when she doesn't understand what God is doing and why God is doing and how God is doing, how does she hold it together? Well, part of the answer has to be the shepherds. Let's talk about the shepherds. They're out in the field. Gabriel comes, tells them all this good news. The angelic choir begins to sing. And then the shepherds go to Mary to tell Mary what the angel said. Don't miss this. She's in a manger moment. 
And the angel sends shepherds to tell Mary the Savior's been born. She's wondering if this child is whom God said he was going to be. And it takes some shepherds who heard from the angels to tell her. Now, now come here, because there's a problem here. The problem is that Mary hasn't heard from Gabriel for nine months. Gabriel showed up, said you're going to be pregnant, and ain't been around since. And in those nine months, some doubt has crept up into Mary. In those nine months, imagine what she's had to go through. Don't, don't be so sanctified that you miss the reality that she's not married and she's showing as pregnant. Do you know how they looked at unwed pregnant women back then? For nine months, she's been under scandal and scorn. For nine months, she's been trying to persuade Joseph to know this wasn't me for nine months. She's trying to hold it together for nine months. She's got questions. And when Gabriel shows up, he goes to the shepherds. Why not come to me? Why does Gabriel not go to the manger to tell Mary what she needs to hear? Because maybe I wouldn't have this manger moment if you showed up, God. Maybe I wouldn't be having these questions if you just gave me a sign. Maybe I'd be doing better if you did a little something. Maybe I'd stay out of this manger moment if you answered at least one of my prayers. But the angel doesn't come to Mary. The angel goes to the shepherds. Now, before you miss the depth of it, you've got to remember the perception of shepherds. Shepherds were not reputable. Shepherds were not wealthy. Shepherds were seen as shiftless and lazy and predatory. They let their flocks just graze over other people's land, eating the grass and leaving the waste. Shepherds smelled like sheep. Nobody messed with shepherds. Shepherds were not who you entrusted with a word. And the angel tells these shepherds who come to Mary, and now Mary has to ask herself a question. Do I trust these shepherds? Do I trust that they've actually heard from Gabriel and are bringing me the word I need? Shepherds, aren't wise men. Hear me. The wise men aren't sent first. The shepherds are sent first. The gold doesn't come first. The smelly shepherds come first. No frankincense, no myrrh. Just some smelly shepherds come and telling me what God said. Now the question is, do I trust shepherds? Can I tell you why Mary ought to trust the shepherds? And, and y'all, this is going to be so simple, some folk going to miss it. I guarantee you, three folk on your pew going to miss this. <laughs> Let me tell you why Mary should trust shepherds. You ready? Because she's in a manger. You got it. You, no, you, you missed it. You, 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 you missed it. Uh, why trust the shepherds? Because I'm in a place where sheep hang out. And God has sent me someone who knows the circumstance I'm going through to give me the word I need from the Lord because God knows that in a manger moment, I don't need gold, I don't need frankincense, I don't need myrrh. I need somebody that's been where I've been and seen what I've seen and smelled what I smelled to get me through where I am. 
You know what I need most? Some shepherds. When I come to church, I'm looking for some shepherds. Let me pause right quick, because you may be fooled by the gold on their wrist. You may be fooled by the frankincense in that bag. You may get it twisted because they smell like myrrh. But there's some shepherds in here who've been in some bad situations, who've had their back against the wall, who couldn't do nothing but trust God. And I need some shepherds right now who can be a living witness that God is able to bring you through Do me a favor and don't somebody tell him, trust me, trust, trust me when I tell you that he answers prayer. Trust me when I tell you that he makes ways out of no ways. Trust me when I tell you that when you call on the name of the Lord, trust me. Uh, she trusts them. And watch what happens, y'all. It's time for Christmas. The Bible says she's having a manger moment. But Denzel, one of the most powerful things that happens is in verse 21, that even though she's in a manger moment, on the eighth day, she had him circumcised and gave him the name Jesus. Don't miss this. I'm going somewhere. She's having doubts, but on the eighth day, she has him circumcised and gives him the name Jesus. You must remember that the eighth day after a male child was born was critical in Jewish tradition. It was the start of a new week. It, they now believed that the child would live, and so the child had to be circumcised in order to be identified as Jewish, and then the name had to be given, and the name was already chosen by Gabriel. Remember, when Gabriel goes to Mary in Luke chapter 1, he tells her the baby's name is going to be Jesus. He does the same thing with Joseph in Matthew chapter 2, tells him the baby's name is going to be Joseph. And so watch this. She's having a merry moment, but she still circumcises according to the law, and still names him based on what God said the name was going to be. Don't miss this. Even though she's having a merry moment, she obeys the law and does what God told her to do because she realizes that Jesus has to be circumcised in order to be identified as Jewish, and his name must be given Jesus, which means God saves. Don't miss this. She's having a merry moment, but realizes I still have responsibility to do what God called me to do to set up the glory of Jesus. If Jesus is not circumcised, he will not be identified as king of the Jews. If his name is not God saves, I violated God's will. And so I've got to recognize that even though I may be having a merry moment, I am part of the story of the glory of God in Jesus Christ that is bigger than my own life. Family, this is the deepest thing God has pressed on my life in my preaching life that I now share with you. It is a reminder that our story is not just our story. That God has incorporated us into the larger story of salvation in Jesus Christ. Which means that what God does in your life is not always centered on your dreams and desires. How God moves is not always based on your wants and wishes. What God allows is not always what you want. 
because you are playing a role in a larger story that ain't about you. Oh, it's going to get quiet right here. Because you want the preaching and teaching to lead you to believe that everything God does is what you want to have done and that all God wants you to do is walk in favor and be blessed that when your praises go up, your blessings come down and you can name it. No, no, real faith says this, that I accept that I am part of a story that is not just about me but about what God is doing in the ongoing story of Jesus Christ. Beloved, you are part of a story that began long before you were born. It began when Adam and Eve introduced sin into the world. And God realized, I've got to fix that problem. It's part of a story that shows the failure of the law to put us in right relationship with God. And God declaring, I've got to do something more than just the law. You're part of a story that began when God decided in the fullness of time that I would descend in the flesh so that the world could see my glory. You're part of a story that, that incorporates Ruth and Boaz, who had Obed, who had Jesse, who had David. You're part of a story that involves Zechariah and Elizabeth getting pregnant to give birth to John, who set the stage for Jesus. You're part of a story that incorporates wise men traveling a thousand miles just to see the glory of God. You're part of a bigger story than your own life. Okay, you're quiet. I I'm done because... I knew that was going to be hard, so the Lord gave me a way to help you understand it. I want you to know uh, that before I became a pastor, um, I was in medical school. And for those that know, I dropped out of medical school. I am a proud medical school dropout. <laughs> um, and before medical school, I need you to know that I had a burgeoning film career. Some of you all may not know this. Um, I... I I'm an actor. Yes, um, and I am in a motion picture. Yes, I am. Um, it came out in 1993. Uh, they were filming it at Duke University. And it's called The Program. Um, and, and Halle Berry's in it. I co-starred in a movie. <laughs> I, I, I co-starred. And then back in 1993, Halle Berry, <laughs> that was as good as it got back in 1993. Let me tell you how my acting career began. Uh, they were filming uh, the program at Duke University, and in the newspaper on campus, they had a casting call uh, for some folk they wanted to put in a movie. And so I went to the, to the casting call and there were about 100 folk there, and I got selected to be in the cast of the program. Now, I really didn't co-star. I was an extra. <laughs> um, uh, and I'm in a scene where Hallie's talking to Omar Epps, and, and, and I walk by behind them, um, <laughs> if you don't have paws, <laughs> you ain't gonna see me, but, 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 I, but I was selected to be part of the cast, even though I didn't have a major role, even though I didn't talk a lot, even though my name doesn't show up, even though I don't get a lot of credit, I got to meet Halle Berry. And the reason I'm grateful for the role that I played was because it introduced me to Halle Berry. Now, if you know that you've been cast in a role of the story of salvation in Jesus Christ, you ought to be glad that it introduced
introduce you to the Savior of the world. Is there anybody here that's grateful for the role you play? Grateful that it introduced me to Jesus. Not somebody tell them you got a role to play. You, you've, you've been cast in the role weeping may endure for a night. But that means you got to endure some weeping. You've been cast in the role grace is sufficient. But that means you got to get some thorns in your life. You've been cast in the role, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. But that means you're going to lose some loved ones along the way. You've been cast in the role, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. But that means you got to have some enemies who are trying to take you out. You've been cast in the role. God is a healer. But that means you got to get a diagnosis one day. You've been cast in a role of the story of salvation. Which means you're going to have some manger moments. Because what God is doing through you is to bear witness, watch this, of his witness. It's a witness of his witness. So that someone else will know that God is with us. In your manger, in your diagnosis, in your heartbreak, in your anxiety, in your depression, God is with us. Hear the good news, I will never leave you, nor will I forsake you. God, we have manger moments. And I'm so grateful that I don't have to pretend that I've never been there. I don't have to pretend, oh God, that I haven't doubted and questioned and wondered and worried and wrestled with your will. And thank you, God, for accepting that sometimes centerio is all I get. I'll give you the best I have today, and I'll try again tomorrow. I'm just going to get through it today, oh God. And tomorrow we'll start again. That I'm just trying to hold it together when I feel like falling apart. And Lord, how I bless you for the shepherds around me. The folk who I can trust because they've, they've been there. That shepherd on my left or my right who you sent to this space today to remind me that you still answer prayer, that you still heal disease, that you still watch over our children and our families. And thank you, O oh God, that I am part of a story that is bigger than my own life. So today, God, we bear witness of your witness that we've only made it because you're with us. And we say to your name be the glory. This is our prayer as we celebrate our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I don't think there's ever been a child who left a gift underneath the tree with their name on it. If you know it's yours, you ought to open it. 
God has given us the amazing gift of salvation in Jesus Christ, and your name is written all over it. My question today is, will you leave that gift unopened? Will you walk out of this worship service? Will you log off and not open your heart to the gift of God in Jesus Christ? Please don't let that be your story. Receive this gift today. All you need to do is either go home online, fill out our form, let us know you want to be saved. Even more, you can talk to a deacon today at this altar or in the lobby on the way out, and they'll gladly share with you all the amazing things that happens when you become part of this cast of the story of salvation. Do me a favor, please don't forget today to be faithful and obedient as God will give you opportunity to give of your gifts to the Lord to help us continue growing the kingdom of Christ, sharing the love of Jesus, and transforming lives. We bless the Lord our God for our time in worship. I look forward to seeing you all back here today at 11 p.m. If you can't join us in the space, join us online as we light the last candle of Advent, the light of Jesus Christ. We leave now on the voices of the Psalms of Praise who bless us in our final selection. to the Almighty, the all-wise, the eternal and sovereign, the faithful and omnipotent, the Emmanuel God, who alone is creator of heaven and earth, to the God who's made himself perfectly known to us in Jesus, who always and alone is our Christ, our loving Lord, our sacrificial Savior, our resurrected, risen, reigning, returning Redeemer, to the God who's chosen to dwell in these earthen vessels of clay, through the sustaining power, promise, presence, purpose, and person of the Holy Spirit. To that all wise God be both glory and majesty, dominion and power from now until eternity. And all those who love the Lord and awaited his return said amen. May the grace of God go with you. Merry Christmas, family. Welcome to Alfred Street's Worship Experience as we continue to celebrate the season of Advent. Now, here are the upcoming announcements for this week. We know that these are difficult and challenging times. We invite you to stay connected by participating in our online worship services and remain faithful in your giving online via our Alfred Street website, ASBC app, and on our text messaging system. If you have any questions about giving, please feel free to email our finance department at finance at alfredstreet.org. If you're interested in becoming a member of the historic Alfred Street Baptist Church, please email deacons with an S at alfredstreet.org or complete the membership form on our website or on our ASBC app. 
Are you looking for an incredible opportunity to share your musical talents? If so, look no further. Alfred Street Sanctified Symphony Orchestra is thrilled to announce that they are recruiting talented musicians like you to join their harmonious family. They're calling for all musicians to join them every Friday evening from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Send an email to sanctifiedsymphony at alfredstreet.org if interested. They can't wait to welcome you into the Alfred Street Baptist Church Sanctified Symphony Orchestra. Hey, Alfred Street. Versus is back in stock. Our Versus team has been working around the clock to create another batch of our popular Versus Bible-based trivia card game, and they're now available for purchase. That's right. Purchase your set of Versus cards today before we sell out again. Visit our website or ASBC app and be the first to get your hands on Versus, a Bible-based trivia game by Alfred Street Baptist Church. God has great plans for Alfred Tree Baptist Church in 2024. We encourage each of you to make a contribution online above and beyond your regular tithes and offering by no later than Sunday, December 31st at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's right. In order for your tax-deductible contributions or donations to be included in our Finance Department's 2023 Tax Charitable Contribution Report, one must do the following. Make your donation or contribution online at alfredstreet.org or via our ASBC app or text to give system or our Realm membership giving system by no later than 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time on Sunday, December 31st, 2023. Or you can mail your check or money order to the church directly using our office address, 325 South Patrick Street, Alexandria, Virginia, 22314. All mail donations or contributions must be postmarked by no later than Sunday, December 31st, 2023. Any donations or contributions received on or after January 1st, 2024, regardless if it's online, via the U.S. mail, or during in-person worship experience, will be counted as a 2024 donation, regardless of what date has been placed on your check or money order. Please note that a 2023 date on a check or money order does not make it a 2023 donation. Only checks or money orders mailed to the church directly and postmarked by no later than Sunday, December 31st, 2023, will be counted in our 2023 Tax Charitable Contribution Report. Please email finance at alfredstreet.org with any questions or concerns regarding your end-of-year giving. Alfred Street thanks you in advance for your unwavering support and generosity. Alfred Street family and friends, get ready. Seek 2024 is coming. That's right. Beginning January 22nd through February 11th, our own Reverend Dr. Howard John Wesley will lead Alfred Street in our annual church-wide corporate fast known as Seek 2024. Seek is a 21-day spiritual fast providing guidance to Christians from all around the world on how to practice self-discipline and to focus their entire attention on God. Again, Seek 2024 will commence on Monday, January 22nd and will end on Saturday, February 11th. Please note that our online registration for Seek will open on Tuesday, January 2nd, 2024. During this time, participants will be able to choose a physical, social, technological, and or financial fast. Everyone will have an opportunity to participate in our daily prayers, which will commence on the morning of January 22nd. A devotional journal filled with thought-provoking passages related to scripture will also be available for download from the ASBC website once Seek 2024 begins. Pastor Wesley will curate a special Seek 2024 music playlist, which will be available to download from our website. And new for 2024, we'll be introducing an exercise component, a prayer walk every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. crossing the Woodrow Wilson Bridge in Alexandria, Virginia. Last year, Seek 2023 attracted nearly 12,000 participants. Remember, everyone who would like to participate in Seek 2024 must register online when registration opens on Tuesday, January 2nd, 2024. We look forward to connecting with you all through our Seek 2024 fast. We invite everyone to celebrate the holiday season with your Alfred Street family by joining us in person and or virtually for one of our following worship experiences. Sunday, December 24th, Music and Worship Arts Ministry presents Caroling on the Portico. Join us in person at Alfred Street from 10 p.m. to 1045 p.m. Eastern Time. Christmas Eve Candlelight Vesper Service happening in person and online starting at 11 p.m. Eastern Time. The doors open at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. 
On Monday, December 25th, Christmas Day, there will be no worship experience. Please visit our YouTube channel to watch the countdown to our Christmas celebration concert. On Sunday, December 31st, please join us on New Year's Eve for one of our regular worship experiences at either 8 a.m. or 11 a.m. We invite everyone to join us on Sunday, December 31st, New Year's Eve, for our in-person and live-streamed worship experience starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Doors will open at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. On Monday, January 1st, 2024, New Year's Day, please note that there will be no in-person worship experience. Alfred Street family and friends, we invite you to save the date. Everyone mark your calendars now and make plans to join us in person here at Alfred Street Baptist Church for Seminary Saturdays, happening online and in person every Saturday throughout the month of January in 2024 from 8.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. noon. Seminary Saturdays are Alfred Street's dynamic weekly Bible study series featuring a different and amazing guest scholar each Saturday who will deliver an insightful and informative lecture. You don't want to miss it. Alfred Street's Office of Christian Care and Counseling in conjunction with the Health and Well-Being Recovery Ministry present a bi-weekly peer support session virtually via Zoom. That's every first and third Wednesday from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Visit our website for the Zoom link information. The Recovery Ministry peer support sessions will provide a safe and confidential environment to confront addictions, compulsive behaviors, and issues that interfere with a renewed relationship with God. Email recovery at alfredstreet.org for details. Calling all parents and guardians of children, youth, and teens, Alfred Street's Children and Youth Ministries are back. We're currently accepting registrations for Kid Street, Crossover, and Higher Ground. Visit our website to register your child or youth today. Alfred Street invites everyone to join the Joyce K. Peterson Handbell Ringers. They are thrilled to announce that their ensemble recruitment is now open. If you have a passion for music and a heart for worship, we invite you to be a part of this harmonious journey. If you can read music and are eager to contribute your talents to a musical ministry that touches souls, this is your moment to shine. For more info and to express your interest, please email handbell at alfredstreet.org. Alfred Street's Office of Christian Care and Counseling, in conjunction with our Divorce Care Ministry, present their fall sessions virtually every Thursday, starting at 12 p.m. noon through 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. These sessions will continue through December 21st. Email divorcecare at alfredstreet.org. Our Faith Savage Gun tutorial ministry has a new home online. Communicate, learn, and stay informed all in one place. Visit our new webpage and check us out today at alfredstreet.org. Email tutorial at alfredstreet.org for details. Our Office of Christian Care and Counseling presents our hybrid, the Chronic Pain Support Group, facilitated by Mr. Jorge Wallace. This is a weekly support group designed to aid in the recovery needed from the emotional and spiritual debilitation of chronic pain and chronic illness. Recovery is defined as the ability to live peacefully, joyfully, and comfortably with ourselves and others. Chronic Pain Anonymous is a worldwide fellowship of individuals that understand the isolation, fear, and despair many have experienced when living with unpredictable and life-changing chronic illness and chronic pain. This support group will occur every Wednesday through December 20th. Email pastoralcounseling at alfredstreet.org for details. Our ASBC Village Study Guide is now available on the website to download. Be sure to check out a copy if you want to go deeper with Pastor Wesley's sermon prepared for you by the Villages of Alfred Street team. The guide is available online at alfredstreet.org. We invite everyone to join us for daily prayer call at 7 a.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. Join us in prayer and praise Monday through Friday only by dialing 425-436-6277, access code 246-114-POUND sign. Again, that's 425-436-6277, access code 246-114-POUND sign. Our new prayer line number will accommodate up to 2,000 participants. However, once we reach capacity, we will continue to offer the playback option. Call our playback number anytime after 7.30 a.m. Eastern Time each day, Monday through Friday, and you'll be able to replay the prayer call that you missed. To reach the playback line, please dial 
436-6278 and enter the access code 246114 pound sign. Please note that this is not a toll-free number and therefore depending on your phone carrier, rates may apply. Hey Alfred Street family and friends, are you visiting us for the very first time or perhaps you're new to Alfred Street and you want to stay connected to us or receive the latest Alfred Street updates via text? If so, all visitors text the word visitors with an S to our new direct text number 571-977-4525. That's 571-977-4525. Also, we invite you to tune in to our Faith Forward Weekly Radio broadcast featuring Pastor Howard John Wesley every Sunday morning at 7.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on Magic 102.3 FM and 92.7 FM for a powerful sermon that will move you forward in your faith. For more information on these and all the exciting events taking place here at Alfred Street, please log on to alfredstreet.org.